morning, everybody. I'm delighted to welcome you all to the National Disability Authority's first fully virtual annual conference. And I would like to extend a warm welcome to all of our speakers today, in particular, Minister of State with the Responsibility for Disability, Ms. Anne Rabbit, TD, who will formally open the conference this morning and Minister for of State with Responsibility for Law Reform, Mr. James Brown, TD, who will deliver address later in the day. And this year, the theme of the conference will focus on facilitating the effective and equal participation of persons with disabilities in the Irish criminal justice system. The UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities has, for many years, informed the NDA's work as a statutory independent research and advisory body to government, and it will continue to do so. The NDA is committed to bringing evidence-informed advice and learning from people with, um, fr from the experience and uh, expertise of persons with disabilities themselves to guide the policies, programs, and strategies developed by government. And we seek to understand the challenges that may impact progress and to identify practical solutions and good practice that will support the effective use of resources to achieve the Convention's goals. The Convention also places duties on states with regard to promoting universal design. And Ireland is unique in having a Centre for Excellence in Universal Design, which is part of the National Disability Authority. The adoption of universal design will mean that the world in which we live is easy to access, understand, and to use by everyone, regardless of our age, size, ability, or disability. So this is an opportune time to focus on this one complex article of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability, and that's Article 13. So it's now over two years since Ireland ratified the Convention and the deadline for submitting the first state report to the UN Committee is quickly approaching. Article 13 is an article which demands the close collaboration and effective partnership of ste several stakeholders, many of whom are here today, both as, as speakers and as attendees, and you're all very welcome. It seeks to ensure effective access to justice for persons with disabilities on an equal basis with others. It requires the Department of Justice, the Court Service, the Prison Service and the Probation Service to have a common understanding of the requirements of Article 13 and to collaborate effectively to ensure that the protections of the Convention are afforded to individuals with disabilities at every stage of the Irish criminal justice system. And key to achieving the goal of Article 13 is also the involvement and the collaboration of departments and agencies not always recognised for their role in achieving uh, criminal justice. For instance, you have the education and healthcare services, uh, including mental health supports, and they play a hugely significant role in diverting people with disabilities away from the criminal justice system and for re rehabilitating those who are already in it. The provision of housing, employment, welfare supports and healthcare are crucial to those with disabilities who have left prison. And this too entails multi-agency cooperation. So I'm very pleased to say that we are joined today by the former UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, Catalina de Vandas Aguiar, who completed her term of office last month. During her six year mandate, Catalina placed access to justice for persons with disabilities at the forefront of her work. And this work culminated in the recent publication of the International Principles and Guidelines on Access to Justice for Persons with Disabilities. And I look forward to learning from Catalina about the measures Ireland needs to take to progressively realise Article 13 of the Convention. 
Also timely is the renewed focus on enhancing access to justice contained in the refreshed National Disability Inclusion Strategy. And this strategy, our own strategy, went, underwent a midterm review in the last 12 months. And following several rounds of consultation, a number of new actions were inserted. <clears throat> One such action was Action 18B, which commits the Department of Justice to integrate a focus on the needs of persons with disabilities in its initiatives to enhance access to justice. And in this regard, I very much look forward to hearing from Andrew Walter, who works in Australia's Attorney General's Department. And Andrew is coming all the way here today to share his insights on how best to progress and improve access to justice for persons with disabilities through a national disability strategy, in this case, Australia. Action 18C of Ireland's refreshed National Disability Inclusion Strategy committed the National Disability Authority to develop independent advice on the use of intermediaries for persons with communication dis difficulties in the criminal justice system. And we're happy to say that this advice has been developed and sent to the Department of Justice for consideration. In that advice, the NDA proposes an approach that would enable the justice system to secure the best evidence possible from persons who may have communication difficulties through the use of registered intermediaries, while also affording them the right to do so and to be treated uh, as, as uh, equal citizens. So I'm looking forward to hearing Catherine O'Neill, Chair of Intermediaries for Justice, discuss how a similar scheme works in England and Wales. The National Disability Inclusion Strategy also includes a commitment to ensuring that the needs of persons with disabilities are central to the Department of Justice's review of the Prohibition of Incitement to Hatred Act of 1989 and its development of legislation on hate crime. The NDA contributed to the consultation on the review of the 1989 Act, advising that the absence of protections for persons with disabilities in the current legislation be revised, especially in light of Article 16 of the Convention, which requires state parties to take all appropriate legislative, administrative, social and educational me measures to pr protect persons with disabilities from violence and abuse. I am delighted that Dr. Seamus Taylor will join us to deliver a comparative look at disabled hate crime, during which important learning from England and Wales can be highlighted. How timely it is to feature another plenary speaker in light of the recent historic event of Patricia Heffernan becoming the first deaf person to sit on a jury and take part in deliberations just last month. Raymond Byrne, full-time commissioner at the Law Reform Commission, will remind us of the historic case taken in 2010, challenging the exclusion of deaf people from jury service and the subsequent work carried out by the Law Reform Commission, which paved the way for Ms. Heffernan, Ms. Heffernan to carry out her civic duty. So that will be the end of the morning session. And we have a very exciting lineup in the afternoon as well. So our first contribution in the afternoon session will be from the president of the High Court, uh, Ms. Justice Mary Irvine. And we are deeply honored that Justice Irvine has agreed to share some of her extensive experience and knowledge with us today. And she will offer some reflections on access to justice persons with disabilities. Thanks to the virtual aspect of this year's conference, we're able to double the number of breakout sessions on offer after lunch. And this provides a great opportunity to comprehensively examine all aspects of the justice and criminal, criminal justice system in Ireland, from policing and courts to prison and probation. And we have also been able to provide for discussion on children with disabilities in the youth justice system. 
and the issues of supporting decision-making, advocacy and safeguarding. Other new features of this virtual approach are the video gallery and the opportunity to ask questions of speakers. In the video gallery, you will find short clips which feature different perspectives on disabilities and the Irish criminal justice system. I would encourage you to watch those uh, videos either during lunch break or after the event. And I wish to thank As I Am, the National Autism Charity, and also Joan Clark, a Galway woman who took that successful legal action in 2010, challenging the blanket ban on deaf persons serving on duties. Thank to, thanks to you both for contributing to this uh, video gallery. If you wish to ask a question, please use the question and action, uh, answer function on your screens at any time. Our moderators will collect these questions and direct them towards the appropriate uh, speaker during the question and answer session later. So on my own behalf, and on behalf of the board members of the authority, I'd like to take this opportunity on this unusual and special year to thank each and every one of our NDA staff who have worked particularly hard this year, given the year that's in it. Uh, and they have adapted and been very flexible and creative in doing their work. And they've gone about that with real diligence and creativity. So a special thanks as well to those who organised this event. I know it must have caused a few uh, sleepless nights, but I'm sure it will be all worth your great efforts. And my latest knowledge is that about 260 people have registered for the conference. So that's truly wonderful. Finally, I'm happy to say that all presentations, documents and videos will be available to access on the NDA website after the event. So now let me reiterate once more how welcome you, every single one of you is to this conference. I hope you enjoy it and find it informative and thought provoking. And it gives me great pleasure now to invite Minister Rabbit, Minister of State Res with Responsibility for Disability to formally open our conference. Thank you. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. You can hear me there, I hope. Um, and thank you, Helen, uh, for the introduction. And it's, it, it's great to be with you here this morning uh, to open the NDA Annual Conference of 2020. As Minister for State um, for Disability, I'm looking forward to working with the NDA across all its various functions to advise on matters relevant to the lives of people with disabilities. The information and the evidence the NDA will provide to me will be essential in moving the government's disability policy agenda forward. The implementation of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, which this conference is focused on, is a huge priority for me. It gives us a clear roadmap uh, for how we can bring about tangible, positive changes in the lives of persons with a disability. As you might know, there are a number of legislative changes um, that still have to be made for Ireland to achieve full implementation of the UNCRPD. With Minister O'Gorman, I intend to bring forward a, a suite, a disability bill to ensure these changes. The bill will also meet a number of commitments in our programme for government, like the planned doubling of the 6% in the public service employment target for people with disability and improving access to jury service for persons with a disability. In mentioning jury service, like what Helen did just a few seconds ago, I, I have to express my delight at fellow Galway woman, um, Patricia Herfernan, um, who made history last month by becoming the first deaf person to sit on a jury and to take part in deliberations. Ms. Herfernan was assisted in her task by a number, by a number of ISL interpreters. Wouldn't it be brilliant to see many more following her footsteps as we increase um, the diversity and accessibility for jury service in Ireland? By ratifying the UNCRPD as we have, we have had to draft Ireland's initial state party report to the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. 
In spite of issues arising out of COVID-19, my department has taken a lead role in drafting the report over the past few months and it is now at an advanced stage. Once they have finished the drafting, the report will be published for consultation. Um, this will be an important opportunity for all stakeholders and in particular people with disabilities themselves to have their say on the draft report, report before it is submitted to the UN. And I strongly encourage anyone who has an interest in or is affected by the issues related to disability to take part in the consultation when it opens later on this year. To help ensure that this consultation process is truly accessible to people with disability, I am establishing a new participation and consultation network for people with disabilities. Um, by doing this, I am meeting one of the key commitments arising from the midterm review of the NDIS that was published earlier this year. This network will provide people um, support to people with disabilities and their organisations to take part in policy development, not just in my own department, but in time across a full range of policy, different departments of public policy making. This is a crucial piece in our progressive implementation of the Convention here in Ireland. I am delighted that my department has secured the funding for the network and the funding, much of which will be available to disabled people's organisations, will assist those organisations in developing their capacity, support their members, provide the training and run consultation on behalf um, of the network. We are currently working to select our delivery partners for the network and I hope to be able to announce that very, very soon. Then a separate process will be announced for organisation groups or suitable qualified individuals with disabilities who wish to join the network. The process of preparing our first CRPD report through a genuinely participative process will be huge learning opportunity for everyone. That includes the newly formed Department of Children Equality, Disability Integration and Youth, who will coordinate the report. But also for the newly formed independent monitoring mechanism, a requirement under Article 33 of the Convention, which the Irish Human Rights and Equality Commission is leading on. The NDA is supporting the IHREC in carrying out the independent monitoring. Specifically, the NDA will be ensuring that the most up-to-date and relevant information is available to the monitoring group to inform an essential and valuable independent assessment of the state of play in Ireland. It will also be an opportunity for our civil society groups to feed into this reporting process by submitting shadow reports. That may be a new experience for some organisations who may not have been involved with other international reporting arrangements. I want to really encourage all those who can take advantage of that opportunity to do so. We know that Ireland's report will not be perfect. Everyone attending here today and who has a disability or lives or works with someone with a disability knows that there is a long way to go in Ireland's journey towards full implementation and compliance with the Convention. The state knows and accepts that. But I really genuinely believe there is much that we can report on that is positive. It is important that we keep working to ensure that people with disabilities can enjoy their rights and live free of discrimination. The CRPD reporting progress process does help that. Following the state's appearance before the committee, a report will be issued to highlight areas of for improvement. That will then help to inform our policy agenda on disability inclusion for the next period. In my role as Minister of State with special responsibility for disability, I am also responsible for chairing the National Disability Inclusion Strategy Steering Group. The steering group is responsible for driving implementation of our National Disability Inclusion Strategy. I have to mention the work, the important work that the NDA does to support implementation of the NDIS through its independent research and advice. 
In particular, I want to highlight the NDA's work in independently monitoring and evaluating progress in the implementation of the NDIS. Finally, I, I was lucky enough to get logged on, Helen, and to the, the rest of the members there. And I heard your array uh, of speakers that you have today and your breakout rooms. And I really, really must compliment you on the caliber uh, of speakers that you have today. And maybe sometimes technology is great. And we, uh, is great, and we should embrace the positivity of being able to gather. I think it was over two hundred members. You said there today, sitting in and being able to participate. It. And, and if times were different, maybe might that might not be the case. But thanks to Zoom and technology, we'll embrace this, and we have embraced it for the last number of months, where a lot of uh, persons with disability took to technology so so well. And that brought about a new ray of inclusion in the whole conversation. And here we are practicing it today. So I want to wish you the very, very best of luck for the rest of the day. Thanks a million again for inviting me to, to be a speaker here this morning. I feel very honoured on it. And, and I look forward to working with yourself, everybody within DND, and all your other members and organisations. So have a great day. Thank you very much, Minister Rabbit. Good morning and welcome everyone to this virtual conference. My name is Dr. Aideen Hartney and I'm the newly appointed director of the National Disability Authority. I may be a familiar face to some of you having led the NDA's policy, research and public affairs team over the last four years, but I'm very much looking forward to working with everybody in this new role. Now, it gives me great pleasure to welcome our first keynote speaker this morning. Catalina de Vandas Aguilar. Catalina has recently been appointed as ambassador of Costa Rica to the UN in Geneva, and I want at the outset to offer our congratulations to her on this new role. Until last month, Catalina held the position of UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, where she placed access to justice for persons with disabilities firmly on the international agenda. And we look forward to hearing some of her insights in this regard today. I want to acknowledge all of her excellent work on behalf of persons with disabilities over her six year mandate as the special rapporteur. Before passing her the floor, it would be remiss of me not to briefly mention that Ireland's Professor Gerard Quinn, Emeritus Professor at NUIG, has recently been appointed as Catalina's successor. We wish him the very best in his role as UN special rapporteur and know that he has very big boots to fill. Finally, Please be advised that you can submit questions at any time by using the Q&A function on the right hand side of your screens. We will collect these questions and put as many of them as possible to the speakers during the Q&A sessions. And with that, let me give the floor to Catalina. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And thank you very much, uh, Madame Harney, for these uh, warm words of welcome. For me, it's a great honor to participate in this important um, Congress or conference uh, organized by the Irish Commission. And um, of course, also to um, clarify, as you said, I'm not longer the special rapporteur. I had the honor for six years, but I'm also very happy to know that my, my successor is Professor Gerard Quinn. Uh, the disability community has a lot to celebrate with this designation, and I'm pretty sure that he will be uh, standing for the rights of, uh, of the community, of everybody, in the best uh, way possible. So we have to congratulate also the Irish people for sharing with us the, the fantastic uh, name and the work and the trajectory of Professor Quinn. So again, uh, thank you to the National Disability Authority for inviting me to participate and to share with you a little bit of what was done uh, in the area of access to justice and the mandate. As you highlighted, we worked on the process of um, dismantling a little bit the Article 13 of the Convention on Access to Justice of Four Persons with Disabilities and more or less over the last two years, and also with the support of the National University of Ireland and Galway, we um, en engage in a process to create an international set of principles and guidelines on access to justice for persons with disabilities. But let me uh, 
take you a little bit back on why did we need that. And of course, this is, this is not secret for, for anyone and for all of those in the audience that are following the disability rights discussions closely, that uh, we have a lot of challenges when it comes to access and justice that this is difficult for persons with disabilities and that we uh, of course face challenges on legal restrictions on the exercise of legal capacity for instance including sometimes restrictions that impact on our capacity to stand trial uh, there is a lack of accessibility physical accessibility in many uh, facilities uh, that are for instance the courts or the police stations and this is across the world uh, we lack, for instance, accessible transportation to get us to and from those facilities. Uh, there is a lack of information in accessible formats, uh, lack of adequate adaptations to facilitate communication for persons with disabilities. We also face negative attitudes that question the ability of people with disabilities uh, to be part of the legal proceedings, including, for instance, to testify. And I'm very glad to hear about this first the person, deaf person that was part of a, of a jury, because that has also been a challenge how persons with disabilities can participate through all parts of the legal proceedings. Then we have obstacles to access free and legal assistance. And of course, uh, we are a witness and a lack of training of the professionals working in the field of justice um, to be in, in line with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. We all know that access to justice is a fundamental right in itself, and it's an essential prerequisite, prerequisite uh, for the protection and promotion of all other human rights. And because of this, this is fundamental uh, that we get uh, access to justice on equal basis with others for persons with disabilities. Access to justice is an all encompassing right. It includes, of course, the right to fair trial, which includes on its own the equal access um, to and the equality before the courts the right to be heard by an independent and, in, and an impartial tribunal, the right to an effective remedy, as well as procedure guarantees, just, such as the right to a presumption, presumption of innocence. Even, uh, and we will discuss this further, uh, we are, it includes access to justice and this right includes equal access to the jurisdictional function. And that's something that we will, and we had incorporated in the principles and guidelines. Then we also want to look at what the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities says about access to justice. We have to remember that the convention marks a, a tremendous change in the paradigm, um, that it includes the notion of uh, the recognition of human rights universally for persons with disabilities. So we are talking about the recognition of all rights for all persons with disabilities. I would like to insist on that. It prohibits, uh, the treaty prohibits the detrimental or the differential treatment based on impairment. And if of, cor of course it clarifies um, how we need to understand human rights in the context of disability. So how do we make sure that we adequate the standards, the principles that are already in all the human rights machinery to make sure that persons with disabilities can enjoy those rights on an equal basis with others. Article 13 on a specific of the CRPD, uh, it's key. It's of course the first time that an international convention includes or recognizes explicitly the right to access to justice. Uh, it introduces the demand to access to justice for all persons, uh, including persons with disabilities. And this means that states need to eliminate the obstacles and barriers they face, uh, the persons with disabilities face, so that they can have equal access to justice. That also states that um, the participation of persons with disabilities in all stages and in all functions of the justice system should be equitable. And this is a basic element of the right to access to justice. We are talking about expanding access to justice beyond just the parties of a, of a process, right? Persons with disabilities should be uh, in all the other 
uh, stages of the process and not only if they are a party of the process. And then the convention in Article 13 also introduces a key innovation. And that key innovation is the provision of procedural and age appropriate accommodation. And we will discuss this later, but this is fundamental because it makes a difference between the reasonable accommodation and um, it's a fundamental element that guarantees the equal access for persons with disabilities to all the legal procedures. And then also the convention in Article 13 provides for an, the need to uh, provide training uh, for those working in the field of the administration of justice and making sure that they understand the high standards that are introduced by the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Of course, we cannot read Article 13 on a vacuum. It is important to remember that there are strong links with other articles of the Convention. So when we are reading Article 13, we have to remember that we are also talking about Article 5 on equality and non-discrimination, about Article 12, it's fundamental, the, the, legal, the full uh, recognition of legal capacity for persons with disabilities. Then of course, Article 14 on liberty and personal security of the person and Article 19 on independent living on, uh, in the community. The convention should be read as a whole and Article 13 in particular will benefit from um, this complete or comprehensive reading of the convention. In the last uh, 10 years and, and since the, the entry into force of the convention, the human rights community working on disability rights has uh, started to unpack the content of Article 13 and different UN mechanisms have been producing documents and reports on this issue so that uh, we were trying to complete the interpretation of the standards of Article 13 of the Convention. For instance, I will mention that the CRPD committee, uh, through uh, its uh, concluding observations and, and comments, has been unpacking Article 13, not yet with a general comment, but we expect that that will happen soon. Also, we have an Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights report on access to justice for persons with disabilities uh, that was presented in December 2017. Um, we also worked uh, together with, as I mentioned, with the National University of Ireland in Galway um, to produce a study. We commanded, I, I commissioned a study um, to understand how access to justice for persons with disabilities was working around the world. And this uh, report was produced and uh, or finalized in February this year. And we also had two important expert meetings around this, this um, uh, study. Then the uh, Secretary General of the UN, together with the Office of the High Commissioner, have also produced a report on access to justice with a special emphasis on access to justice for persons with disabilities. This report is already available and it's going to be presented anytime soon in the discussions on the third committee of the General Assembly. And uh, Finally, uh, together with the Com Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities and with the Special Envoy on uh, Accessibility and Disability from the Secretary General, um, and of course the, the, the mandate of the Special Rapporteur, uh, we produce uh, the international principles and guidelines on access to justice that were mentioned uh, before and that were launched uh, recently in, in August. So how did we produce these principles and how did we get there and what is the objective of these principles? First of all, the objective of these principles is to assist the states, to support states and in general any other actor uh, to design, develop and modify and implement their justice systems so that they can actually provide equal access to justice for persons with disabilities. We had an intention to uh, the guidelines to be broad enough to apply to all uh, the legal processes. So we are talking about civil, criminal, and administrative uh, procedures, including also the alternative dis dispute resolution mechanisms. 
Uh, the principles are also aimed to be applied during all stages of the processes. So we are talking about the final product, the final moments, but also we are talking about the preliminary stages of the process. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the principles should apply regardless of the roles of the persons with disabilities in the process. So either if there are direct or indirect participants, the guidelines should apply. Needless to say, the guidelines and principles aim to be in line with the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, and we try to reflect some good practices in it so that it can serve as a good model for states that are trying to figure out how to move forward with this. Um, I don't have, of course, the time to go through the whole list of, uh, of um, guidelines, but I would like to highlight that we came out after this process of work with the National University of uh, Ireland and Galway. And with the uh, two expert meetings, we finally decided to uh, adopt 10 principles. Uh, each of those principles have detailed guidelines, but I would like to just highlight and, and name and read to you the, the 10 principles so that you can see the scope. Uh, of the document. So principle one, uh, it's about how we need to recognize that all persons with disabilities have legal capacity and therefore no one sh shall be denied access to justice on the basis of a disability. Principle two uh, relates to universal accessibility, universal design, and how facilities and services must be accessible to ensure equal access to justice without discrimination. Principle three refer to the procedural accommodations. So how persons with disabilities should receive appropriate procedural accommodations. Principle four as uh, relates to access to legal notices and information how we need to receive this information in a timely and accessible manner on an equal basis with others. Principle five, it's about how our community is entitled to all uh, substantive and procedural safeguards that are already recognized in the international law. And this is of course on an equal basis with others. Uh, principle six, it's about the right to access of free and affordable legal assistance or legal aid. And principle seven is about the right to participate in the administration of justice. So for instance, the jury or any other uh, role as a judge, uh, for instance, how persons with disabilities should be allowed to participate. Uh, when it comes to principle eight, it's about the rights to report and complain um, and initiate the legal procedure so we can be active uh, parts of the procedures. Uh, so when it concerns human rights violation, crimes, etc. Uh, and principle nine and 10 are referring to the need to have, first of all, robust monitoring mechanisms and principle 10 about how do we uh, raise the awareness of those working in the, con in the context of justice, access to justice, right? We, we think that these principles contain the basic uh, needs that persons with disabilities face, the basic challenges that persons with disabilities face. And um, I would like to just highlight now some of the most important uh, principles, uh, because we don't have the time. I would just like to focus on the principle on legal capacity and on the, on the principle of uh, procedural accommodation. Um, because I think that those are quite fundamental one and, and the second one is quite innovative and we need to understand better uh, what do we wanna say or what the convention uh, wanted to say when they included the notion of procedural accommodation. So the first one, the principle on uh, the universal recognition of a legal capacity, um, it's, it's fundamental. As you know, Article 12 of the Convention is one of the greatest innovations and one of the areas in which more progress we've seen since the adoption of the Convention. We know that the denial of uh, legal capacity affects particularly persons with intellectual, cognitive, and psychosocial disabilities, although it expands to, to many other 
um, especially those that have uh, great or graded support needs, people with uh, several palsy, for instance, deaf blind people, and in some cases, even blind and deaf people. Normally or often the denial of legal capacity entails denial to access to justice, whether if, whereas if uh, as direct or an indirect participant, um, it is considered that the testimony of persons uh, are with disability, certain persons with disability is not worth uh, of belief. And this is outrageous. Then we also, you know, often uh, it is says that because a person is under a substitute decision making regime, for instance, guardianship, they are not allowed to participate or they have to participate through their uh, legal representatives. It has another problem, the, the lack of recognition of legal capacity and as a diversion to a special processes processes in which persons with disabilities lose all the other guarantees that are uh, included in the due process and, and where the focus is on the, on the capacity of an individual and of the individual and not on the objective elements of the crime, for instance. And of course, uh, there is also a risk of the imposition of security measures. So for instance, when we are dealing with criminal cases, some you know, people with intellectual or psychosocial disabilities might be considered to be unfit to stand trial, or they are exempted from criminal responsibility and then refer to forensic services or institutions when they, where they could stay for longer periods of time than the ones that would have been uh, mandatory by their, the, the criminal responsibility. In these centers, uh, they will have, as I was saying, less procedural guarantees than in the regular criminal justice system. Uh, and they might also be under restricted regimes. Um, they will have fewer access to recreational, educational, and health services uh, than the people that is ordinary and uh, that is held, sorry, in ordinary prisons. So what we are recommended uh, to make sure that these guides are implemented is uh, we need to have legislative reform for the universal recognition of legal capacity. We also need to have innovative judicial practice uh, on recognizing how to engage and participate with, with persons with uh, certain disabilities. We recognize and we assume that the full legal capacity of all persons with disabilities is granted and that they have the right to participate in all legal procedures. Um, there is also a call to eliminate all restrictions related to cognitive incapacity and mental incapacity. We question the limitations to participate in the processes at witness. Uh, so we reject the idea that only experts can provide testimonies. Questioning also the detention measures, um, for instance, uh, I'm sorry, questioning detention measures that come as consequence of having the care persons with disabilities unfit to, to trial or to appear in court. So what it's called the security measures, sometimes people is detained because uh, of, of this um, uh, unfit to trial decision and uh, hoping that the provision of procedural accommodation can allow people with disabilities to participate effectively in all the processes. And this is important because that, um, lead us to the discussion on procedural accommodations. First of all, we have to discuss, and this is on principle three, that persons with disabilities, including children, have the rights to appropriate procedural accommodation, is to define what is a procedural accommodation and how it differs from the reasonable accommodation concept. First of all, the definition, so it is, uh, we will understand by a procedural accommodation, all necessary and appropriated modifications and adjustments in the context of access to justice. Where needed in a particular case, this is important, and to ensure the participation of persons with disabilities on equal basis with others. And the difference with the reasonable accommodation is that procedural accommodations are not limited by the concept of disproportionate or undue burden. So we have to provide accommodation to make sure that persons with disabilities can participate. 
The objective, of course, is to avoid discrimination and guarantee the effective and equal participation of all persons with disabilities and the procedures. And it's also important to highlight that these accommodations are comprehensive because they cover all the necessary and appropriate modifications and adjustments that are required in a particular case, including, for instance, facilitators, intermediaries, uh, procedural adjustments, modifications, adjustment to the environment of the court, the support and communication. There are many ways, there is no one way to accommodate, there are many ways uh, of accommodate and, and they are uh, fully comprehensive and should be considered as that. There are ways, and, and I would like to explain because sometimes when we think of accommodation, we really think of very uh, concrete measures. Uh, but in this case, uh, the flexibility needs to be uh, very broad and we need to apply and understand, for instance, we have independent intermediaries and facilitators, and those are people who support the justice system to ensure the effective communication during the judicial process. Uh, and this might work for certain groups of persons with disabilities, but should be applied across the board for those that request it. Uh, the intermediaries could also support people to understand and to make informed decisions making sure that things are explained and stated in a way that these persons can understand and that they have uh, the appropriate adjustments and supports provided to them to understand. Importantly, these intermediaries need to be neutral. They will never speak on behalf of persons with disabilities or on behalf of the judicial system, uh, nor do they lead or influence decisions or our outcomes. We need to focus on the neutrality of these intermediaries to really play their role as an interface uh, of persons with disabilities with the court. And then um, the work of intermediaries is also key so that a person, person is not considered unfit to participate in the process, right? How this person can really be that interface that facilitates the interaction with the court. Um, the guidelines recommend uh, to implement this principle three on, on the procedural accommodations beyond what I've said of understanding the flexibility and the comprehensiveness of, of the accommodations, uh, that there is a need for states to first of all establish uh, and funding uh, a program of independent intermediaries or facilitators in a manner that is consistent with the CRPD, so respecting that those intermediaries are going to respect the autonomy of persons with disabilities, their independence and their will and preferences. We also recommend that to implement this principle, we need to adopt uh, procedures for hearings that ensure the fair, treat the fair treatment and full participation of persons with disabilities. And then for instance, we are talking about adaptation of the venues, uh, appropriate waiting spaces for persons with disabilities, the removal of clocks and, and wigs, uh, which is a very traditional in, in some legal systems, which could be intimidatory for persons with disabilities, the adjustment of the pace of the proceedings, uh, we might need more time, uh, more breaks uh, during the proceedings, uh, modification of the method of questioning or making interviews to, to those that might need that. Uh, in some cases, the use of technology, the use of pre-trial video recording instead of having the person come into the uh, uh, courtroom, and also allowing persons with disabilities to be accompanied by a person of their choice, whether a family member, a friend, or, or any other person that would provide emotional support and moral support to go through the process. In general, we need to ensure that the communication support is provided for all the parties, whether you are uh, participating in the process as witness, or claimants, or defenders, as, as juror, uh, and that for instance, things like sign language, captioning, etc. It's of course granted, it's taken for granted that needs to be provided. And we need to ensure that the procedural accommodation for persons with disabilities uh, is provided for all, including those that are accused of crimes that are already prisoners and, and detainees.
In closing, I'm very sorry oh, to interrupt yeah. Catalina, but we just need to keep an eye on the time. Apologies. Oh, yeah, I know. I'm just closing. So uh, I thank you very much. I think that the principles will provide an important guidelines uh, to states. Um, and uh, we hope that this is going to make a difference and going to help in recognizing what are the main challenges that we have. And thank you very much for this opportunity. I uh, apologize I took longer. Um, thank you very much, Catalina, and apologies for having to disrupt your flow there at the end. We, we have a jam-packed uh, program, but many thank you, thanks for that fascinating perspective on this crucial article of UNCRPD. And just a reminder to everybody that if you do have questions for any of our speakers, you can submit them through the question and answer function on the right-hand side of your screen, and, and we'll take a few questions uh, following our next speaker. So our next distinguished speaker is Andrew Walter, uh, and he's joining us from almost the opposite end of, of the time zone, I think. So uh, that really does underline how wonderful technology is uh, to, to facilitate this kind of event. Andrew is first assistant secretary in the integrity and security division of Australia's attorney general's department. And he's going to speak to us today about progressing justice reform through Australia's national disability strategy. So we look forward to hearing Andrew's insights and to considering how we might apply these in an Irish context, particularly as attention turns to development of a successor to our own national disability inclusion strategy. So Andrew, the floor, or in this case, the screen is now yours. Uh, thank you so much, Aideen, uh, and good morning to everyone. Um, can I start by thanking the National Disability Authority for the uh, invitation to speak to you uh, all today, uh, and particular thanks for the excellent arrangements you've made for my participation. Um, before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the beautiful and, I must say, uncommonly green land from which I'm speaking to you, uh, the Ngunnawal people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and emerging. Um, as you can possibly see behind me, it's uh, pretty dark here. I've spent my day in front of the Senate asking, answering questions on the range of issues that I'm responsible for. Interestingly, uh, senators were particularly interested in the topic that uh, we're talking about today, which is um, implementation of Article 13 of the CRPD, which was fantastic. Um, before starting, can I also acknowledge the other speakers in this morning's session? Uh, what an extraordinary group of people to be uh, uh, put with. Uh, and uh, particularly if I can just acknowledge the outgoing Special Rapporteur and her wonderful contribution um, over the past six years. So over the past decade, um, Australia has appointed a rolling series of royal commissions into the failure of our social institutions to care for the most vulnerable members of our community. The first of these addressed the horrendous failures of our government and charitable institutions to protect children from the worst forms of sexual and other abuse. This was quickly followed by Royal Commissions into aged care and into violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disability, both of which are ongoing. A common theme across these inquiries has been the systemic failure of our institutions to create environments where vulnerable people and their carers are heard, are believed, and are given the opportunity to participate as fully as possible in the decisions that impact on their lives. I want to begin this morning with a brief case study from a fourth Royal Commission, which concluded in 2017 and concerned the detention and protection of children in the Northern Territory. The commission was established after the airing of uh, some disturbing footage by our national broadcaster of children being violently restrained and subjected to verbal and other forms of abuse uh, whilst in the Dondale Detention Centre. The case I want to point to is that of a young woman identified by the initials AN. AN spent approximately 18 months in the youth detention system between the ages of 13 and 16. Ayn's childhood was characterized by abuse and trauma. She had a significant cognitive impairment and she had some level of hearing and vis vision loss. She was first detained, detained at the age of 13. And at that time she was, was, was assessed as having a mental age of just seven and a half. Suffice to say, youth detention was not a good experience for Ayn. 
Her behaviour in detention was often violent and was punctuated by incidents of self-harm. The Royal Commission pointed to a litany of failures by authorities that would uh, be laughable, I think, if they weren't so appalling. Everything from losing medication through the use of isolation and restraining devices to, ta uh, to try to tackle her deteriorating mental health. Detention facilities, as I'm sure many of you are aware, are complex places at the best of times, and I don't want to underplay that in any, uh, in any way. However, despite having considerable information as to her needs, it was only when things became utterly desperate that anything like a plan to support AM was put in place. It is common in, in cases such as AM to say that the system failed. Uh, for me, that answer is uh, too easy and indeed uh, too lazy. Leaving aside the moments of sheer incompetence, what AM's case demonstrates is that the system didn't fail AM. It did exactly what its particular combination of elements, connections and purposes was designed to do. The design implies a level of intentionality that may not be appropriate here. In simple terms, if we want to change the outcome, we need to change the system. This brings me squarely to the topic on which I've been asked to speak, how Australia is progressing justice reform through its national disability strategy. Australia ratified the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities in 2008 and has a deep commitment to its core purposes. We are thrilled that Ireland has ratified the convention. It is difficult to think of a more important international agreement. The CRPD, as it's commonly called, was the first international human rights instrument to enshrine an explicit right to access to justice. Article 13 of the CP CRPD goes beyond the notions of ensuring a fair trial and effective remedies, important as those are. It highlights that access to justice for persons with disability requires not only the removal of barriers, but also the promotion of active participation by persons with disability in the administration of justice. Australia has worked to incorporate the CRPD into nationwide initiatives, in particular, the National Disability Strategy, which will be the focus of my remarks this morning. Before turning to the strategy, I need to give you one brief piece of constitutional context. And despite being a lawyer, I promise to keep this brief. Australia is a federation consisting of a national government and eight state and territory governments. Under the constitution, it is the states and territories that have primary responsibility for most aspects of our justice system, though not all. For example, uh, most criminal matters are investigated by state or territory police, are tried in state or territory courts, and convicted offenders are detained in state and territory prisons. Consequently, implementing national action on access to justice requires cooperation and consultation between all Australian governments. The National Disability Strategy 2010 to 2020, which I'll refer to as the NDS, is Australia's overarching policy framework for meeting our obligations under the CRPD. The development of the NDS was the first time in Australia's history that all Australian governments committed to a unified national approach to improve the lives of people with disability. Their families and their carers were also taken into account in this process. The NDS sets out six key policy outcome areas which were developed through consultation with people with disability and which reflect the principles of the CRPD. These areas are inclusive and accessible communities, rights protection, uh, sorry, rights protection, justice and legislation, economic security, personal and community support, learning and skills and health and well-being. The consultation process that underpinned the NDS identified access to justice as essential to ensuring people with disability can enjoy their rights. Accordingly, this was identified as one of the five key policy directions under the rights protection, justice and legislation outcome area. Significantly, the NDS, like the CRPD, embraces an inclusive understanding of what access to justice requires. There is a tendency in my view to assume that as long as a person has legal representation, and access to justice has been secured. However, the crux of Article 13, as we've already heard, is participation, not representation. The NDS recognises that ensuring effective participation requires everything from accessible courtrooms, 
through to the relaxation of evidential requirements in certain circumstances, through to the employment of more people with lived experience of disability in all aspects of the justice system. Article 13 is an active obligation, not a passive one, and the NDS reflects this. The NDS contains a mixture of short-term commitments as well as areas requiring ongoing policy development. As you'd expect, the short-term commitments way back in 2010 focused on immediate steps for implementing the CRPD, given we had only ratified it two years earlier. Ongoing policy development focused on some more challenging areas, such as supporting people with heightened vulnerabilities who come into contact with the criminal justice system. The NDS was a substantial achievement in 2010 and has set the uh, direction for national policy over the last decade. Review work undertaken recently to inform the next iteration of the NDS has found that overall it has been a force for good. The strength of the NDS is the disability community's sense of ownership of it, driven in part by the extensive consultation process that was undertaken during its development. Significantly, a survey undertaken as part of that review work found that 43% of respondents thought that upholding the rights of people with disability has improved over the past five years. However, this work has also highlighted some broader challenges to our implementation of the obligations in Article 13 of the CRPD, including inconsistent implementation, particularly in regional and remote areas, a lack of clarity about roles and responsibilities as between the various levels of Australian governments, and the absence of a strong formalized performance reporting framework to measure progress. Of particular concern for me was a finding that while mechanisms exist for persons with disability to access justice, people don't know about them or are unable to access them. To give these high level findings some more substance, I want to refer to some work we have, been, we have undertaken with respect to the area uh, for ongoing policy work I highlighted earlier, uh, namely support for people who have a heightened vulnerability in their context with the justice system and more narrowly people who are found unfit to plead. And this is something the ambassador has already touched upon. So uh, we didn't coordinate, but uh, uh, happily uh, we are talking about a similar uh, issue. So in 2016, a working group from all Australian governments finalized the national statement of principles relating to persons unfit to plead or found not guilty by reason of cognitive or mental health impairment. These national principles recognize the rights of people with cognitive or mental health impairment and seek to identify safeguards to be applied both during relevant legal processes and during the period in which a person is subject to orders. In 2019, the national principles were adopted by all states and territories uh, with one exception, uh, that one exception uh, nonetheless committed to the, uh, the general uh, direction of the principles. The national principles require tailored case management plans, coordination and collaboration between agencies, NGOs and professionals supporting a person found unfit to plead, provision of reasonable adjustments to ensure participation, orders that impose only minimum restrictions on a person's rights, and most significantly, I think anyway, regular review of orders. While the principles have been generally well received, they have been criticised for being developed without sufficient input from people with disability. And in 2019, uh, the Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities noted that while the principles are beneficial, legislation across the states and territories still views persons with disability as being unfit to plead. It may be of some interest to uh, those of you who are more legally minded, that recently a report by Tasmanian Law Reform recommended the defence of insanity and definitions within, with, with respect to fitness to stand trial be updated. The report argues that current Tasmanian tests, for example, on fitness to stand trial, focuses too much on a checklist of intellectual abilities and not on whether or not a person is able to meaningfully participate in a trial. To sum up, the principles are a good start, but there is more work to be done. Similarly, a number of jurisdictions in Australia have developed disability justice plans which seek to make justice as accessible as possible for, people, for persons with disability. These focus on everything from improving remedies for discrimination through to improving the way first responders deal, responders deal with incidents involving people with disability. Where these plans exist, they've been well received. 
The criticism of them is that they vary across different states and territories, and there is no single national response. Finally, to give you one other brief and somewhat less, less equivocal example, uh, since 2015, people with disability and their carers are now treated as priority clients for receipt, receipt of legal assistance under the federally funded component of the National Partnership Agreement on Legal Assistance. While we might argue over the quantum, although we're talking about over well over a billion dollars here, this is a significant development for persons uh, with disability who need legal assistance. All Australian governments are currently working together with the Australian community to create a new disability, national disability strategy uh, to replace the NDS, which expires at the end of this year. The Australian government is committed to ensuring the new strategy is informed by people with disability, just as the first one was, and is reflective of their needs and desired outcomes. And we're working on a co-design process. To achieve this goal, the consultation process has included an accessible public submissions process, which allows for people to respond to a guided questionnaire or provide their own submission, targeted focus groups with, uh, with people with disability that were harder to reach in stage one consultations, uh, for example, people with intellectual disability and people with disability in regional, rural and remote areas, collaborative cross-sector workshops on specific topics, and disability representative organisation workshops held with national disability peak bodies and disability representative organisations through fully accessible online mechanisms. Access to justice will continue to be a policy priority under the new strategy. The research tells us that it continues to be a significant problem in every jurisdiction in Australia. The strategy will be strengthened by more specific action plans and by, strong outcomes, by a strong outcomes framework to monitor performance, supported by a data improvement strategy and evaluation protocols to improve policies and programs and achieve better outcomes for people with disability. We expect the strategy will be uh, launched in mid-2021. I began with the story of AM. I did so to highlight the complexity of issues associated with access to justice for people with disability. When I first read the Royal Commission's report, my initial response was, how on earth does a girl with a mental age of seven and a half end up in juvenile detention? The brutally honest answer to that question is because the system is designed for that to occur. The system AM found herself in was designed to manage her it didn't accommodate her needs and most significantly, I think, it didn't facilitate her participation in the decisions made about her welfare. The focus on access to justice in the NDS is intended to address exactly the type of failings highlighted by the Royal Commission in AN's case. Reforming the justice system for people with disability is complex, and requires concerted efforts across a range of domains. We don't pretend we have all the answers. However, I hope these thoughts have been of some value to you as you begin your own journey or continue your own journey down the Article 13 implementation path. I wish you all the best in that endeavour and for the remainder of what I'm sure is going to be a fascinating conference. I thank you again for including me. It's, uh, it's been a great pleasure and a great honour. Thank you very much, Andrew, for that very practical look at how reform can be underpinned and supported by, by a national strategy. Uh, and thank you very much as well for some very impressive timekeeping. Um, we now have some time for just a few questions uh, in order to allow us a short break uh, and a reminder that you can submit your questions on the right hand side of the panel uh, of your screen. Um, I just have a few questions coming in here that, that I might put. Um, certainly, um, I, I might uh, selfishly ask one that's uh, of great interest to the NDA, um, Andrew, if I may. Um, we understand that the UN Committee on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities raised concerns about the absence of national data disaggregated by disability at all stages of the criminal justice system uh, in your review last year. Um, is this something that there are plans to address uh, as part of the development of the new strategy? Thank you. It's a really good question. Yes, data was a, an issue that was raised um, throughout our committee appearance and obviously in the conclusions and recommendations. Um, we are certainly looking at aspects of, of, of data as part of the strategy. Um, and as I mentioned, we are looking at what, you know, what a performance framework would be like and what data do we need to support that and what data do we need to improve that. 
But there's also work going on separately through our, um, we have a council of uh, corrective services um, and work has been going on through that. Um, and also in a number of other contexts, uh, including in the context of the development of the national principles I mentioned to improve the data we have, particularly around certain vulnerable cohorts, such as those uh, people who are found unfit to plead. So there is a whole range of data work going on across the, uh, across the spectrum. Uh, but yes, it's a, it's a very big focus for us because uh, yeah, we don't have enough right now to make the type of evidence-based decisions we want to be able to make. Great, Th thank you very much. Um, just a, a question in here that uh, either of you could answer, but I might ask uh, Catalina to go first. Um, as we start here in Ireland, moving on a, on a journey of participation um, with our newly established consultation and participation network that the minister was speaking of, um, could you give your perspectives on, on what the key to success of effective engagement might be? Yes, uh, hello. Well, it is very important. I mean, if I understood your question, it's about two elements for a successful strategy. S sorry, yeah, I, I mean, it, it, to get effective participation, are, are there particular secrets of success there? Um. <laughs> yes, of course. Well, we need to make sure that the, the consultation is it's, it's fully accessible. And that means that even if we utilize now, and of course, with the situation, the remote mechanisms, we need to make sure that the platforms will guarantee uh, full accessibility for all those that want to participate, right? Whether there are going to be online consultations, whether it's uh, online forms, how to make sure that the information is accessible for blind people, for deaf people, for people with intellectual disabilities. It's important to always produce materials on easy to read um, and, and to, to create a space which is easy to navigate for all persons with disabilities, that would be one. And the second one is of course, to make sure that we are doing uh, an, uh, an important effort of outreach. Many of the members of the disability community are not exposed uh, to this means of consultation. And unfortunately, we still see that, that some of the organizations also of persons with disabilities don't necessarily have the capacity to outreach all of its members. So resources have to be in place to have a, a very significant outreach campaign uh, with all the disability community so that everybody can really um, be part of it and be aware of this process of consultation in the first place. So I will uh, do these two elements, accessibility and outreach. Great, thank you. Um, maybe just because um, um, my uh, team are, are giving me prompts on time here. Uh, it's a, a related question, but um, maybe it's just the last one we have time for, for, for Andrew. Um, I mean, you mentioned the impressive um, co-production process you have in place now for your, for your replacement strategy, but have you had feedback from people with disabilities as to any aspect of that that they are pleased with in, in particular? That's a question from Francis. Sorry, Andrew seems to be on mute. No, Andrew can't come in. Okay, um, that's okay. No worries at all. Um, we uh, we can collect answers to some of these questions maybe afterwards. It's, that's a pity now. Um, but I suppose it does mean um, we uh, can move to our break now. And I'm sorry that we, that's all the time for questions that we have, but we do need to start promptly again at 11.20 because we have three plenary speakers um, in the next session before we get to uh, Minister Brown's contribution. Um, but thank you again to Catalina and to Andrew for um, those fascinating uh, presentations and to, to answering those questions. So as I say, we'll be back here sharply at 11.20.
it's Adrian. I'll introduce you, Catherine. Oh, fine. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. And I hope that gave you enough time to boil a kettle and, and make a cup of tea. Uh, our next speaker is Catherine O'Neill, a registered intermediary and the chairperson of Intermediaries for Justice in England. The title of Catherine's contribution is The Positive Impact of Intermediaries in the Criminal Justice System. And as you heard this morning, the subject is a topical one in the Irish context. In addition to the recent publication of the NDA's advice paper on the subject, the O'Malley report also called for the creation of a register of qualified intermediaries. We look forward to hearing from Catherine about how intermediaries have improved the operation of the criminal justice system in the UK and how we too might benefit from such a system here in Ireland. And again, just a reminder that you can use the Q&A function on the right hand side of the screen and we put a selection of your questions to the speakers at the end of this session. And with that, Catherine, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for inviting me to, to participate today. I just wish I was in Dublin. Um, from my name, you might realise I've got quite a few relatives and I've got a great affinity to Ireland, but maybe next time. Um, yes, as um, Aideen said, I am the chair of Intermediaries for Justice. This is a charity that we have set up, a small group of intermediaries to raise public awareness about fair access to justice for all. Um, the next slide, please. So I've got to get in the rhythm of this. I'm actually um, a speech and language therapist and I'm a psychological therapist. And um, I have worked, also I'm a specialist in trauma um, and trauma informed practice is something that might come into our discussion today because it's very, very relevant at the moment and um, being highlighted in the, um, in, in the English um, system as an area that needs great improvement, knowledge about trauma. Um, next slide, please. Um, what is an intermediary? Um, we are from a variety of backgrounds. Um, many of us are speech and language therapists, um, clinical psychologists, occupational therapists, and specialist teachers. Uh, psychiatric nurses, but the majority at the moment are speech and language therapists, and we hope that that will change in the future. Um, we were brought in um, as a statutory right for witnesses about 15 years ago. Um, it um, is something that was difficult in the beginning. It is still difficult at times in, to be accepted but now we are really part of the system, particularly for witnesses. Um, we are trained by the Ministry of Justice. I might call it the MOJ occasionally. I just slip back into that. And uh, you have a very um, detailed interview and um, uh, an exam. And they select people with um, a robust clinical background. And I hope an affinity to working with um, fair rights for disability. You must have an expertise in and an understanding in communication. We're communication specialists and um, we should really have life experience, I believe. It's very difficult to be thrown into an arena where people, where you're the odd person out, where legals are used to talking to each other in a certain language and you're a different breed really. And you might be highlighting things that they have never noticed before, or maybe at times might not even want to notice. Um, it's a very, very steep learning curve. And we do witness many things, many shocking things. I, I could go on for hours about that and the unfairness that I have witnessed, um, but I won't. I won't hear, I'm always happy to do any other time. Um, next slide, slide, please. I'm going to try and get them on my phone because they're rather small in front of me. So as I mentioned, witnesses have a statutory right. Uh, currently, defendants don't. Now I've put up different acts um, and criminal practice directions for your reference. I'm not going to go through those now because I know time is, is short. Um, we 
we have this system in England at the moment, which is very unfair. There's a statutory right for witnesses, but not for defendants. So vulnerable defendants do not have access to an intermediary. Many of us, like myself, we choose to work with, intermediary, uh, with, with defendants um, because we feel that this is an unlevel and un unfair playing field. And it's a terrible situation, which I have found myself in many times, to be in the witness box with a vulnerable person and then to look over to the dock and see a person rocking backwards and forwards, clearly not understanding and participating in their trial. So many of us work as independent intermediaries, but we are not registered by the Ministry of Justice when we work like that. We are campaigning to change that. And interestingly, Northern Ireland, as you may know, set up a, a pilot scheme for the inclusion of intermediaries. And they set that scheme up from the very beginning with um, intermediaries working with defendants and witnesses. Um, recently, we have branched out, many of us, and working in the family courts as well, because there are many, many um, people who have learning disabilities or hidden disabilities who are facing um, losing their children or fighting for certain aspects with local authorities and really do need to have fair access to justice. I've recently worked in um, the first immigration case with a young man who was 30 or 36 who had a learning disability and schizophrenia and he was going to be sent back to Jamaica um, and he'd come to England when he was seven so he really had no one in Jamaica or any reference point or any support system. Um, I've also recently worked on an employment uh, tribunal with someone with mental health was needing to take their employer to a type tribunal um, and that was extremely interesting. Both those cases are very interesting. And I think our role can be extended to parole board, to coroner court, to mental health tribunal. Anywhere that people have a, a right, a human right to be heard and have a voice. Um, next slide, please. Okay, and then the next slide, please. Um, these are the people that we work with. Um, I will say, use the term vulnerable, and I hope that translates um, here today. It's just a word that has been um, adopted in statute in Britain for this particular purpose. We work with people, um, any child under 18 who's a witness. So I've worked with two-year-olds or 16-year-olds, and they would have a right to have an intermediary. Um, I work with people with mental health problems, um, learning disability, hidden learning difficulties such as dyslexia, dyspraxia, um, physical disabilities, cerebral palsy, etc., MND, um, and neurodevelopmental disorders such as um, autism, ADHD, um, the vulnerable elderly who very often get forgotten um, and their needs, not saying that um, they're like children, but the, 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 the system is very complex and very frightening for, for, for most of us at the best of times. And for elderly people, it can be very, very different, difficult to um, actually participate effectively. And of course, people who are suffering from the effects of trauma. When someone is traumatized, the language center shuts down in the brain. We know that from MRIs, and that's a particular interest of, of mine. Um, and we're trying to get the, um, the whole of the system to understand the effect of trauma on the ability to communicate. And slowly it's coming in and recently I was invited to um, be part of the independent inquiry into child sexual abuse and one of the main things that came out of that was that the police and judiciary and advocates 
need to be trained in trauma-informed practice. Um, next slide, please. Well, the need, um, I'm sure you're very aware, these are some um, statistics and um, there are some more recent ones which indicate that 70% of people who are in prisons um, and youth offending centres have got significant speech language and communication problems and may not have understood their trials. And, and I have many examples of people not having understood when you go down to the cell and they haven't a clue what's gone on. Um, so I, rather than me describe it, I think we shall watch a film now, which is something that we've just made at um, Intermediaries for Justice. And um, we got a grant, we got an, uh, an award to, to make this. Um, so I'll hand over to Jason, I think, who's going to put the film on, I hope. And then I might talk about some case studies. Knowing that we have a system where we have skilled individuals who can help us understand what the most vulnerable members of society want to say has enabled us to listen to them and has enabled us to ensure that they have a voice, to ensure that no one is disenfranchised from our legal system. Everyone has the right to be heard when they find themselves involved with the justice system. But that can be a real challenge for people who have difficulty communicating. Um, my job is just to help work out how it's best to ask those questions so okay. you can give the best bit of information that you can. My son has um, a diagnosis of Asperger's autism, which means that he cannot um, process the language like you and I would. Information needs to be broken down into smaller pieces for her to understand. In 2004, a new profession was created in the justice system, intermediaries. The role of the intermediaries is set out in law. Intermediaries facilitate communication with witnesses and defendants who have communication needs. Their primary function is to improve the quality of evidence and aid understanding between the court the advocates and the witness or defendant. An intermediary is not there to hold the hand of a witness or defendant. They're not there to be their friend or supporter. Intermediaries are independent of parties and owe their duty to the court. The court has to be certain that he's actually admitting guilt. He, he's got good communication in when he's actually speaking himself. Intermediaries come from a variety of professions, such as speech and language therapy, psychology and psychiatric care, teaching and social work. They undertake further training to become an intermediary. I work with adolescents, and that's through up into adults, uh, including older adults, and uh, it's people who have a history of mental health issues, or learning disability, or learning difficulties, and often a mixture. Of, of all of these. So recently I worked with a, a young person with autistic spectrum disorder and learning difficulties and, and a traumatised young person. Assessing their communication needs, developing a, a working relationship with her in conjunction with other supports that the people around her, the police, the, the police officer and the social worker. Without that, I don't think she would have got to court at all. I tend to work with children and, and vulnerable adults if they've got like an autistic spectrum disorder or learning difficulties or language disorder. I worked with a young man who had a language disorder and speech sounds disorder and um, I know that he would not have been able to give his evidence because nobody could fully understand what he was saying. 
but because I could see the pattern of his speech sound, when he was asked a question, I was able to say word for word what the vulnerable witness was saying. And I always obviously checked with him that I'd got it correct. And that made it possible for the jury to hear and understand his information. I'll just write them down. The intermediary's role begins with a communication assessment. So I might look at things like, can they give me a narrative account of something not associated with the offence, but what's their narrative account like? What kind of questions do they understand? Uh, what depth of information can they give me once I've asked them a question? What their attention skills are like, which gives me an indication as to how long they, the interview process can go on for. An intermediary may assist when someone is interviewed by the police, and if the case goes to trial, the intermediary may be involved in pre-trial preparations and the trial itself. I work with children who've got age-related communication, which basically means that they are vulnerable because of their age. My role is to intervene and ensure that the child does understand and is not agreeing with something just purely because um, it's been put to them in a suggestive or a leading manner. I've had uh, a couple of cases where the victims have been non-verbal, haven't been able to communicate verbally at all, um, and I don't think we'd have got any account from them without an intermediary. During interviews or a trial, the intermediary may intervene if there is miscommunication or the person becomes tired or distressed. When it became difficult for my son in the court, she had got to know him so well that actually she understood when he needed a break and it might have been 10 minutes after the last break but that was when the break needed to come. He was very good at stepping in and saying can you rephrase the question she doesn't uh, understand or can you ask a different question. Intermediaries use a variety of aids to help vulnerable people to communicate about subjects they find difficult to manage anxiety and stress and to communicate non-verbally. So I've got a range of fidget objects here. Kids who maybe have an ADHD diagnosis, but then say having some sort of fidget object helps the brain work across that and just helps them be settled and sit with the, the anxiety. I've also got my take a break card. Sometimes people, it, it, can, it can just reassure people to say, look, if, if, if you're struggling, you don't even need to speak, you can just point. Um, a, a common one, very common for intermediaries, is body maps. Often if it's, if it's a sexual offence, it can be very difficult to talk about the, uh, the specific parts of the body and, and this allows people to point. Quite simple but actually very, very effective and, and used often. My um, experience of, of intermediaries is that they have helped judges understand that there is no one-size-fits-all for all witnesses and defendants. And I think we're now far more alert to what an individual, in fact, needs and requires to give their best evidence. Before, I might have just thought, I can go and do the interview, see how I get on. Now, I, would, I wouldn't even consider doing that without having first considered an intermediary. If we didn't have an intermediary, what, what do you think? Just no. No, she, she, she wouldn't have wanted to go through the interview process, she wouldn't have got, she wouldn't even contemplate going into the court. It gave my son the strength to find his own voice and be understood and be heard. Okay, so could we move on um, through these slides very rapidly, please, Jason? I'm not even going to refer to them. I'll go to the case studies. But this is for your reference. If we just stop on um, this one, it's all about achieving best evidence. So the interview would be recorded with the intermediary having assessed the person to find the best way that they can possibly uh, give their evidence and um, after that if it goes to court the interview the visually recorded interview is used as their evidence in chief 
so they don't need to be examined in court with evidence in chief. And we're just piloting section 28, which is rec pre-recording cross-examination. And I notice in this time of COVID, because a lot of our courts have been shut, um, some vulnerable people um, have been put forward for se section 28 cross-examination rather than waiting till May or next year. Um, we carry on, um, Jason, please, with the next slides. These are sort of things that we might be looking at, strategies to help some with verbal comprehension, chunking questions, no tag, no multi-part questions. Look at their listening and attention. Um, what is the speech intelligibility, intelligibility like? Would the intermediary need to repeat word for word what the person says? Do they need a lapel microphone to um, amplify? Do they need a timeline? Things, a timeline where we put down little post-it stickers to help them with sequential thought. Um, we use figurines and hopefully I'll get to that in a minute and show you some examples. So if we'll skip through these, please, Jason, and um, go on to slide 19. Actually, there's just going back one slide there. There's something I'd like to really highlight. This is a new move in the last few years, which made, has made a huge difference, um, that we review questions in advance. So we have a ground rules hearing if it goes to court with the judge and the barristers. And it, we like to assist in with the barristers in the preparation of their questions. We don't influence what they want to ask but we might suggest ways of asking it um, and this could be to do with the syntax or semantics the way that the structure is formed and we would know from our assessment what someone might be able to cope with best or if it's something is worded in a way that might trigger their emotions then we might suggest another way around um, if we move on I know, I'm not sure how timing is going now. Um, I want to just tell you about Kay. Um, she was a young girl that I worked with, with learning disability. She was 12 years old. She'd recently come from India and was found um, after being here for a year to be pregnant. And um, I was called in after she'd already been interviewed, very, very badly interviewed with, um, round a big conference style table with um, a male interpreter and one male officer and a female officer, a social worker and her mother all sitting around the table and the poor child was so embarrassed. Anyway, a specialist child interviewer was brought in and I was brought in and we used a, a child centered approach, which means adapting the furniture, maybe sitting on the floor for the interview, maybe building up lots and lots of rapport sessions and play. And we used um, drawings and timelines and body part di diagrams and um, female torso. I have a little foam um, model of a female torso so she could point rather than having to say. Um, and the trial went ahead with the assistance of an intermediary. And I'm neutral, so I never talk about whether what the outcome of the trial was. Um, that doesn't, is not part of my role. Um, next slide, please. Um, Amy is a little three-year-old. I assisted with the first FGM case. And you'll see there, there's a mat, a red mat, and um, a little uh, diagram of listening and playing. So it's all about management with very little ones. Um, and so we had this special map for listening when the officer asked her questions. And there was some story um, about the kitchen cabinet and cutting her on the kitchen cabinet um, by falling. Um, but we, in the interview, she was saying, she was almost rehearsing on her fingers what had happened. And then she said, I cut myself on the metal bit. So we shoot by questioning, careful questioning, I was writing down and passing to the officer on post-it stickers, um, questions like, can you test out in the room? So on camera, so the court would see, um, show me something that's plastic, show me something that's wood, show me something that's metal. And she couldn't identify 
materials. So that was um, significant. Um, the evidence in chief was such a clear account in that case that she didn't need to go to court. She wasn't called to court. Um, next slide, please. And I think you know we must tame me in here if I'm going on too long. Um, this isn't terribly clear, but this is using a talking mat for someone who had been stabbed and it had affected the um, cortex in the brain. And um, he and he was not able to do anything apart from eye point and a tiny little bit of movement of one finger. And with assessment, I worked out that he had a clear yes, no response. And he was able to communicate well cognitively by using communication aids. Um, he was able to tell us how many people had attacked him. And it was all over two ounces of weed, which is tragic. Um, and you know how many, uh, what the weapon was. He was able to identify by giving, without leading, many, many different symbols. For example, trying to find out what the weapon was. I prepared lots of symbols, you know, a gun and a hammer and a screwdriver, et cetera, et cetera. And then he could refute, was it the hammer? And he put the eye point to yes or no. So was it um, the screwdriver, yes or no? So I was able to build up a visual picture and he gave him a voice and that went to trial. Um, Sorry to interrupt, Catherine, okay. but we might need to wind it up a bit. Okay, I'm oh, sorry. I have so much to say about the role. If anyone would like to talk to me, or please visit our website. There's lots of information there. And also there's some written information about the pathway uh, of, of how we work currently. Um, and that's um, by the resource section. Um, we haven't got it right yet in Britain. Um, in England, we're, we're trying. Um, but thank you very much for giving me the time to share. Thank you very much, uh, Catherine, for that very, very interesting uh, presentation. And I think there is much learning for us in Ireland uh, from your experiences in the UK. We'll now move straight on to hearing from Raymond Byrne, a full-time commissioner uh, in the Law Reform Commission. And Raymond will discuss the Commission's proposals for law reform in the area of jury service for persons with disabilities. As many of you know, the Draft Disability Miscellaneous Provisions Bill seeks to introduce improvements in the area of jury service. And we look forward to hearing from Raymond about the Commission's views on what these exact changes might be. So over to you, Raymond. Well, thanks very much, Aideen, uh, for that introduction. And thanks also to the NDA for inviting me to speak at this very important conference. So uh, as Aideen has said, I'm talking about the recommendations that the Commission made uh, in uh, our report in uh, 2013. So uh, next slide, please, Jason, if, if you could. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk, um, first of all, briefly about the role of the Law Reform Commission. Um, that's really the equivalent of an ad you might get on Spotify, but without the good music to follow. So apologies for that. Um, then I'm going to talk about the Commission's report uh, in 2013, which covered jury service in general and included recommendations on access to jury service for persons with disabilities. Then I'm going to talk about the influence, of course, of the UN uh, Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, and I'll talk about that in relation to four aspects of our report that uh, addressed access. And the final thing then I will talk um, about developments since 2013, including the draft bill that uh, Aideen has mentioned. Next slide, please, Jason. So this is just a very brief overview of the role of the Commission. And we're a statutory body and our role is to keep the law under review, to carry out research and then to make proposals for law reform. And we do this under a programme of law reform that contains uh, a number of projects that we carry out under uh, a number of years. 
uh, and this report that we conducted in 2013 and published in 2013 formed part of one of those programs of law reform. And in each of our projects, what we do is we will consult with anybody who has an interest in that project. And I can say that we had an enormous amount of interest in that particular project on jury service. And we publish a consultative paper to get the views of people who are interested in the area. And then we receive submissions and we have further discussions and consultations. And all of that is taken into account then by the Commission as we prepare our final report with recommendations for reform. And what we usually try and do is include a draft bill um, that might be helpful uh, for those who are trying to implement those recommendations. Now, we're called the Law Reform Commission, but we can't do any law reform. We're an advisory body. Uh, it's up to the government and the members of the Oireachtas then to decide whether any of the Commission's recommendations are implemented. Having said that, although we're an advisory body, about 70% of our reports have ended up influencing the content of legislation. Next slide, Jason, please. Now I'd like to, having given you that brief ad, talk about the main focus of my presentation, which is uh, the 2013 report on jury service. Now it's one of the Commission's longer reports and it made 56 recommendations for uh, reform of the law on um, uh, jury service. Now, a significant part of the, um, I think we may have, have we skipped a slide uh, there? Um, maybe just go back one slide. Yes, thanks, uh, Jason. So, uh, as I said, uh, we uh, recommended a number of um, things on reform of jury service, including, of course, uh, in terms of today's conference, uh, recommendations in terms of persons with disabilities who are willing and able um, to uh, carry out the functions of a juror uh, provided with suitable uh, facilities, of course, to do that. Now, I'm not going to go through all the 56 recommendations in the report you might be glad to hear, although maybe some of you are really anxious to go through all 56 recommendations, but I'm afraid um, I won't do that and impose that on you. Um, I'll just mention one of the recommendations which are not really relevant to today's conference, and it was that there should be uh, super juries of 15 jurors in very long criminal trials. That's one of the recommendations that has actually been implemented. But I really want to focus on, um, in the next slide, um, the main issues that I wanted to look at. And uh, in particular, you won't be surprised to hear, of course, that the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disability were really very important in terms of the analysis in the um, in the Commission's report. Now, when we did that report in 2013, Ireland had signed but hadn't yet ratified uh, the Convention. So although it wasn't binding on the state at that time, in the Commission we felt it was very important to look at and take full account of the Convention. Now, in terms of those Convention rights, of course, the key principle is set out in Article 13, um, which is all about today's uh, conference, of course, which sets out the key equality principle that states must ensure effective access to justice for persons with disability on an equal basis with others. Now, in addition, there's Article 2 of the Convention, of course, which provides, very importantly, that reasonable accommodation where needed must be in place. And for jury trials, that means putting in place the necessary and appropriate modifications and adjustments where this does not involve a disproportionate or undue burden so that the equality principle can be applied in practice. And of course, uh, we tried as much as possible to apply the principles from the convention in developing some guiding principles ourselves for that report. And one of those, of course, in terms of fundamental rights is that everybody, 
uh, has a right to a fair jury trial. And this includes all the jury members who are willing and able to carry out their duties as jurors. So the question, of course, of capacity to carry out that role in order to ensure a fair trial, including, as Catherine has previously mentioned, where you have um, defendants with disabilities, it's very important for everybody that there should be a fair trial. So I'm now going to go on to look at uh, the particular recommendations that we made in detail. Thanks, Jason. So the first of these is um, in terms of recommending that the equality principle should be applied in practice. And this means, for example, that all those who are members of a jury must be able to understand what's actually being said. And because most trials in Ireland are carried out uh, in the English language, then we recommended that that should be uh, the case. Now, thankfully as well, since our 2013 report, Irish sign language has been given proper statutory recognition. So that's incredibly important in terms of the equality principle in, in practice. Of course, there are some trials that are also carried out in Ireland using the Irish language, and there must also be special supports and facilities in terms of translation for those kinds of trials. So what we recommended was the law on jury service needs to be amended to state that a person is eligible for jury service if he or she is able to understand English to the extent needed to carry out the functions of a member of the jury. So there's a presumption there, very importantly, of capacity, but that that um, uh, must be uh, in place in terms of somebody's understanding and comprehension. Now, the next slide is the second aspect of the equality principle in the fair trial context, and that deals, of course, with physical capacity. Um, and again, there, uh, we recognised in the report that uh, a person's physical capacity may require reasonable accommodation in order for them to carry out um, jury service. And we noted um, uh, in our 2013 report that in 2010, the Central Criminal Court had ruled that Joan Clark, who I know is giving a video presentation here today, uh, was perfectly capable uh, of deliberating uh, as a member of a jury in jury trial with appropriate assistance. Now, in that particular instance, Joan, I think there was uh, an objection, um, which, again, lawyers are perfectly entitled to um, put in challenges to anybody who puts themselves up for uh, jury service. Um, and in that instance, Joan did not actually participate. But that, I think, was a very big breakthrough. And we certainly built on that experience uh, in order to recommend that the law and jury service needed to be amended to make it very explicit and to have a presumption um, that a person is eligible for jury service um, with suitable uh, accommodation um, and that that should be the presumption that applies unless even with those reasonable accommodations, the person would not be in a position to carry out their uh, functions uh, uh, as a juror. And of course, that means that there are assistance now available in those instances, in terms of interpreters, uh, in terms of Irish Sign Language facilities and, and so on. So that has now actually um, been something that can be applied in practice. I'll move on now to the next slide. Um, and uh, this then is about the equality principle in the context of somebody's health. Um, and in that situation, uh, health, again, may be an, an area of capacity where assistance and reasonable accommodation is required. And so what we recommended there again was that we needed to move towards the presumption of capacity that's consistent with the equality principle from the convention and to say that a person is presumed to be eligible for jury service unless their health capacity taking account of reasonable accommodation and support means that they would not be able to carry out their duties uh, as a member of a jury. Um, so what we're talking about there, again, is very importantly a presumption of capacity with supports and accommodation. Another point I think that's worth mentioning, and I'm sure that everybody here is very familiar with, is that we wanted to distinguish very clearly 
between decision-making capacity um, and health issues. So decision-making capacity then is um, in the next uh, slide, but I wanted to make sure that uh, it's understood that the Commission really distinguish between those two issues, even though sometimes there might be overlap. And so the fourth area that the Commission examined then was in the area of decision-making capacity. And uh, in those circumstances then, again, we recommended that there should be that presumption of capacity. Uh, and that presumption of capacity then means that a person with reasonable accommodation uh, and support may very well be able to carry out the duties uh, of a member of a jury. And I've said that we really do think it's very important that decision-making capacity and health issues, although they may sometimes overlap, that those should be distinguished in the law. We were also able to take account of uh, the fact that in 2013, we had the assisted decision-making capacity bill as it was, at that time uh, and we were able to take account of the presumption of capacity that was included in that bill which as we know was enacted two years later and that then brings me to the last of the slides um, in my presentation which is to look uh, briefly at some of the important developments that have occurred uh, since 2013 since we carried out our report and of course of these, one of the most significant is that in 2015, the Assisted Decision-Making Capacity Act became law. Unfortunately, not all of its provisions are in force yet. And along with everyone else, I think, um, I very much look forward to the full implementation of the 2015 Act as soon as possible. And of course, one of the most important aspects of that Act is that it sets down a clear presumption of capacity for every person of 18 years and over. Another development very important from a practical point of view was that in 2017, Richard Dudley was selected for jury service and would have carried out that duty with the assistance of Irish Sign Language interpreters, but this did not actually happen uh, because the defendant in that trial pleaded guilty. So, while, of course, for, from the point of view of a jury trial, that was very important for the uh, victims in, in that situation, um, it wasn't possible for Richard to actually carry out the functions uh, of a juror. And then there were two events that I note here from 2018, from two years ago. First of all, very importantly, Ireland ratified the UN Convention. That's an incredibly important commitment now to, to, by the state to enact further laws to comply with the convention in practice in our national domestic law and of course that includes in the area of uh, jury service um, and that I think is in, very important as Aideen has already mentioned. Something else that happened in 2018 a little bit closer to the Commission's report is that the Department of Justice established a working group uh, to examine uh, all of the recommendations in the Commission's 2013 report that had not yet been implemented. And I obviously very much look forward to the uh, Commission's, uh, that working group's conclusions on the Commission's uh, report. Then moving to this year, the last two aspects of the update that I'd like to refer to is, first of all, the programme for government, which commits the government during its lifetime to reform legislation in Ireland to reflect the commitments that they have made by ratifying the UN Convention. So I think that that's very important. And if I can save the best to last, perhaps, um, the fact that last month, um, uh, Patricia Heffernan carried out jury service with the assistance of two uh, Irish Sign Language interpreters, or maybe in fact three uh, Irish Sign Language interpreters, and she described her very positive experience in carrying out those functions in the Irish Times of the 5th of October, so that's yet another ad this time for the Irish Times, but that's well worth uh, a read, I think. Um, now, Patricia is from Galway, and as a proud Wexfordian, I'm a little bit dubious about mentioning that, 
but I could say, if I might, that like Patricia, my own mother was from Galway, so I hope that that means then that I can fully support uh, Patricia as a Galwegian. That's everything that I have to say uh, on uh, the Commission's recommendations and developments since then. Once again, thank you so much for inviting me to speak here today, and thanks in particular to Jason, Cormac, uh, Romy, Vanessa, and Miriam in particular for all the assistance uh, in making sure that uh, I'm communicating probably better than usual uh, today. So thanks very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Raymond, and thank you for uh, your, your timekeeping as well. And I'm sure we're all looking forward to uh, the next steps in this regard in Ireland. Next up, we have Dr. Seamus Taylor, who is Head of Applied Social Studies in Maynooth University and an expert on disabilist hate crime. Seamus will share with us the learning from England and Wales regarding legislative protections for hate crimes against persons with disability. This is a very timely discussion, not least because the new programme for government commits us to introduce hate crime legislation within 12 months of the formation of the government and to improving protections for people with disabilities against hate crime. So Seamus, you have the screen. Thank you, uh, Aideen. Good afternoon, everybody. I'm pleased to be here and pleased to know that so many people are attending today. What I'll talk about uh, draws on a threefold set of experiences from my period as Director of Equality and Diversity at the Crown Prosecution Service in England and Wales between 2004 and 2009, where I had responsibility for hate crime policy, as a researcher who undertook a PhD in Lancaster University on disability hate crime, and as a lecturer reflecting on and teaching on the hate crime topic uh, within Maynooth University. In terms of, if we could go, um, Jason, to my first slide, in terms of the context within which we're having this discussion, clearly, if we take the long view of history, targeted violence against disabled people is part of a very varied history of disabled people right throughout time. If we go back to ancient Greece and Rome, if we trace through the feudal period, and right up to the Nazi era when we had the mass genocide of disabled people in Nazi Germany. Uh, so in a way, hate crime is in a sense very old behavior in a new crime category. And hate crime as a term is both a popular term and it's also a legislative policy domain. And hate crime as a popular term it conjures up quite a high level of emotion. Hate is a very strong word. You know, it it's conjures up something very serious. But actually, for most hate crime law, the test of proof is either hostility or bias or prejudice. It's not actually hate, although hate crime is the popular term that has entered the lexicon more widely. Hate crime clearly doesn't arise in an ideological vacuum. You know, hate crime relates to wider prejudicial ideologies. We talk about racist crime, and it links back to racism. We talk about homophobic crime, and it links back to homophobia. But when it comes to disability, we don't talk about ableist crime, and we don't talk about ableism so readily. We talk about disability hate crime. And I think that that may reflect the stage we're at in terms of engaging with this topic within uh, disability as an equality strand. Now, we could spend the whole session talking about, well, what is hate crime? And we don't have the time to do that. But the OSCE, in, based in Warsaw and Vienna, have done some of the best international work probably in this area. And they have quite a simple definition of hate crime, which says it's a criminal offence with a, a biased dimension or a hostile dimension. I think it's quite a straightforward definition. It's useful for our purposes. If we look across the European Union as a region today, most countries have hate crime law. And until recently, Ireland has lagged behind, I think ourselves and Malta, 
but that has been addressed as Aideen indicated uh, right now. Uh, most countries, when they've introduced hate crime legislation, have tended to start with racist and religious crimes and then have moved on to um, other protected strands in time. And there is a sense that I found from my research of disability and the disability movement feeling that disability is often a last on the list, that it's added sometime later. Um, moving to the next slide, if we look uh, internationally, we tend to see two main types of hate crime laws existing in Western liberal democracies. We tend to find what are called incitement to hatred laws or expression offences, which deal with hate speech. And then we also find aggravated offences and sentencing enhancement provisions. Uh, the aggravated offences and the sentencing enhancement provisions deal with what we might call the more regular hate crime law or the standard hate crime law. Incitement deals with speech and hate speech, and the others deal with acts which are regular criminal offences which are aggravated by a prejudicial or hostile dimension. Now, moving on again, please. Um, in Ireland, until recently, uh, we were seen probably as something of a policy laggard on hate crime provision, in particular, um, standard hate crime law. On the incitement to hatred front, we were actually uh, relatively early into the uh, legislative arena with a, an act going back to 1989, the Incitement to Hatred Act. It covers race, religion, sexual orientation, and the traveler community. But there have been very few prosecutions to date over the past 30 years. And when I did research in this area back in uh, 2011 for the then Equality Authority, I found a strong sense of a frustrations gap and an expectations gap from stakeholders that I interviewed, that people felt it was the only existing hate crime law and they sought to have it used, but found that it applied in a very narrow range of circumstances and that they felt there was no provision, that there was a gap in the protection for what might be more regular hate crime law. Now, recently, there's been a very significant change in circumstances in Ireland. The Incitement to Hatred Act is under review, and there's a significant flurry of policy and practice activity within the criminal justice system. They, as Aideen said, the government have stated in the programme for government that they will legislate on hate crime within the first 12 months of this government, and there is a review underway. Uh, so there is significant work currently happening. If we move to the next slide, please. Um, I would say, although there is a lot happening now at a policy level led uh, competently by the Department of Justice, I would say practice is probably ahead of policy in a number of areas. There has particularly been significant developments within the Gardaí in recent years. There's work being done to define hate crime. There's work being done to rec improve recording, to report on monitoring, and there's been extensive training undertaken within the Gardaí. I would say of the criminal justice agencies, the Gardaí are probably at the forefront of responding to hate crime to date. That said, all of the agencies have some way to go. There's also been significant development in the NGO sector, particularly in relation to racist and religious crimes. There's uh, ENAR Ireland, the Irish Network Against Racism, which is part of the wider European Network Against Racism, and they produce a six-monthly I-Report system, which is, I think, excellent and potentially provides an example for the other protected characteristics uh, to follow in time. Um, the incitement to hatred review, which is currently underway, I would imagine that one of the areas it's looking at 
is whether the range of protected characteristics should be extended to cover grounds such as disability. And I would say that there is learning from other jurisdictions in this regard, and there's learning from international evidence. There has just come out in 2019 a first academic reader on this topic of inciting hatred against disabled people, edited by um, Professor Mark Sherry in the United States. And it's a collection based on the States, Britain, and other countries, including the Scandinavian countries. And it provides substantial evidence of the case for protecting disability as a ground within incitement legislation. Also, when I worked back at the CPS in the latter part of my time there in 2009 and after I left in 2010, colleagues were undertaking research of a negative discourse online uh, towards disabled people in the context of austerity cuts that were being introduced to the benefit system in Britain at that period of time. And what they found was predictable discourse about uh, disabled people as benefit cheats, as um, benefit fraudsters. But what they also found to their shock in, in the first instance was a discourse that went all the way back to some of the discourse of the Nazi area, describing disabled people as useless feeders and that this was peddled extensively online uh, in that period of the austerity cuts. So there is evidence that we can both glean from our nearest neighbouring jurisdiction in England and Wales, and there's also the academic evidence now to um, support the inclusion of disability within incitement legislation. Um, clearly, once you start talking about incitement to hatred legislation, it immediately raises the issue of balancing hate speech and free speech. And of course, free speech is a bedrock uh, value in a liberal democracy and must be protected and prized. But it, it isn't an absolute privileging of free speech that needs to occur. And we have seen now from evidence in the United States that there is a continuum between hate speech, hate incidents, and hate acts. We have seen that in terms of speeches made by leaders attacking Latino migration, and then it following into hate incidents, and then hate crimes perpetrated at a significant level against Latino migrants. And there is evidence of that continuum that's been written up academically as well. So moving on from the um, issue of the incitement to the second part that I said I would talk about, which is learning more from England and Wales and my experience of engaging with the agenda there. One thing that is of benefit in looking to our closest neighbours is that they have had substantially longer time to engage with this agenda. Uh, so they have had legislative provision for a much longer period of time. That said, England and Wales and Britain more widely is far from a nirvana state on hate crime. So I'm not holding it up as some ideal um, jurisdiction to look to. However, I think it is fair to say that Britain and England and Wales are internationally recognized by the OSCE and by the EU Fundamental Rights Agency and the UN when they have appeared there as having one of the most comprehensive sets of hate crime law. Uh, and they have a high level of hate crime reporting and recording, and they have a high level of hate crime convictions. You might say, well, that makes Britain the hate crime capital of the world. Maybe they have all this because they have so much hate or hostility, but it's, I would argue, and the evidence points, it's because they not only have the law in place over time, but they have activated a policy and practice domain across the various criminal justice agencies that enables recording to take place, that enables reporting to take place. Um, so it's in that context that the comments that I now go on to make are made. 
Now, in Britain, you have incitement to hatred legislation, which is not in some ways dissimilar to Ireland, and it's currently uh, subject to a law commission review in Britain. You will also have standard or regular hate crime law in Britain, which covers both aggravated offences and enhanced sentencing provisions. The aggravated offences only apply to racist and religious crimes currently, and they apply to about uh, 10 to 11 categories. So there are things like regular offences, like assault, criminal damage, and then you have a racially aggravated assault. You have racially aggravated criminal damage. So you have aggravated versions of standard criminal offences, and they carry a higher penalty within the range for uh, for that crime and then you have enhanced sentencing which applies to all crimes outside that specified list and also applies to crimes on the basis of disability uh, gender identity and sexual orientation so you have a kind of varied legal geometry in a way in britain currently now, the legal test, if we move on to the next slide, um, the legal test of proof in hate crime cases in Britain. Currently, it is that an offence ne either needs to be motivated by hostility or at or around the time of offending, there was a demonstration of hostility. So that's the, the test of proof at the moment. And as I said, in the aggravated offences, it covers racist and religious, and then the enhanced sentencing covers sexuality, gender identity, disability, and race and religion for the things beyond. Um, currently, the Law Commission is undertaking a review of hate crime law right across the board in Britain. Uh, this review is actually now at the public consultation phase, and they have issued a very substantial, I think, 500-page document uh, on reviewing the legislation, and the uh, review closes, I think, in December. But um, the indications would seem to point to the Law Commission perhaps going to recommend that the incitement to hatred act in britain is amended to protect disability as a characteristic so that's interesting it seems to be um testing the public view on extending aggravated offenses to give parity to disability and the parity argument is made strongly uh, has been made strongly to them and they, they say it's a, it's a strong argument. Retention of the sentencing enhancement law seems to be something they're favoring. But interestingly, in disability area, for disability hostility crimes, they're saying that the evidence indicates there have been particular challenges faced and that um, what they want to do is to amend the test of proof to introduce perhaps another element, which is uh, prejudice, so that the, you could ha either have a hostile motivation, you could have a demonstration of hostility, or you could be prejudiced towards somebody on the basis of their protected characteristic. When I was undertaking my research on hate crime in Britain, I looked I had access to the DPP's files, uh, case files for one year, 2013-14. I looked at 548 cases that were flagged as potentially disability hate crime across the criminal justice system in England and Wales. What I found was that uh, all those cases were uh, identified as involving a vulnerable victim and some of them were identified as all and also identified as potentially disability hate crime. But what I found was the successful cases all involved an explicit demonstration of hostility. None of the successful cases were proven on motivation. 
the demonstration. So the demonstration usually involved abuse of language at or around the time of offending. So a type of case um, was two disabled men um, who, who meet regularly in a city centre in the north of England um, on sometimes when they're going to a day centre together, they meet and have a chat in the city centre on their way and somebody approached them, uh, assault, abused them verbally and spat on one of them and uh, used abusive language, you effing mong. And that, and then sped off on their bike. And that is a clear demonstration, which was witnessed. They were the other person witnessed it and others in the vicinity heard the language and that was uh, successfully prosecuted but it was reliant on the demonstration of the hostility at the point of the perpetration of the offence and many of the cases that were successful had that demonstration element there wasn't one that was successful solely on the basis of motivation so, Seamus, I'm very sorry to interrupt your flow, but maybe just in the next couple of minutes, you might be able to come to a conclusion. OK, um, then the the one thing I wanted to particularly highlight that emerges in cases involving disabled people in which involve prejudice is this dual focus on vulnerability and hostility, uh, as you will well know. There are, in a sense, in public policy, two paradigms that address disabled people. There's the welfare, care and protection paradigm that sort of targets people down a safeguarding route. And then there's the rights and justice paradigm that is influenced by the UN CRPD and the social model. What I found in these disability hate crime cases was that a non-Jew focus on vulnerability led to a denials of justice where hostility was a real factor. And that in many of the cases, uh, because there was this tendency to see disability and perceive vulnerability as if it was inherent, uh, that what often happened was that people, disabled people's cases involving hostility got hived off to a social care review or got dealt with in the criminal justice system in a way where the hostility dimension was never recognized and that therefore full substantive justice wasn't delivered. So I would say it, for Ireland going forward in terms of the, we have a great opportunity in the next year because we're coming to this legislation later than others we have an opportunity to learn from not only what went, has gone well in Britain, but what has gone less well. And this challenge of the vulnerability focus being undue and over-focused on in hostility cases is something I think we need to learn from. Because I would say when vulnerability is used to target somebody in a disability crime, it's a signal of prejudice. It's a biased selection. You're selecting the person to be the target of crime based on who they are and your perception of equating vulnerability and disability. It's the basis potentially of, of a, a, a hostile crime. The issue shouldn't be sealed off from each other, but should be interrogated together. And I think if we can deal with that in the forthcoming legislation in Ireland, we have a chance to really deliver on the spirit and the substance of Article 13 and Article 16. Now, I'm conscious that because of time, I haven't gone through um, all that I would quite like to on the vulnerability front, but I can answer questions on it if people have any. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Seamus, uh, for some very interesting perspectives on hate crime from England and Wales and indeed from further back in history as well. So we just have a very few minutes uh, for questions before I pass to Minister Brown. Um, so I have a couple submitted already and uh, I might just go through those in order. So 
My first question is for Catherine and it's from Roz and she asks, in terms of training for trauma informed care for police and judiciary, are short courses effective and do that you feel they lead to meaningful change in dealing with persons with a history of trauma? Well, that's a very good question. Um, I suppose it's important to have some knowledge. Um, currently, the knowledge about trauma is very often limited. And I do a lot of training with the police and very often it's a revelation to them to understand about the brain and the body. Um, so it's probably better to have some training, but to weapon their appetite to go on and train further. I think um, not understanding the effect of trauma on the brain and the ability to communicate is a, a very, very um, impotent position to put people in. It, it's, it's impossible to be able to communicate with the police if you're in a traumatized state. And the police need to be able to recognize it and indeed get people in to assist. I think that's the key thing to recognize and for barristers to know what they don't know. That's Great. often a difficulty. Okay, thank you. And just while uh, you have your mic off mute, I'll ask you one final one from uh, Eliona. And she asks, is the type of support you provide, regardless of why the individual is going to court? Um, she's wondering about disabled women who suffer gender based violence. Absolutely. In fact, they don't have to be going to court. It starts with a person making a disclosure or someone making a disclosure on their behalf. So it starts at the very early stage with the police interview. Um, and that's where we come in. And I often say to the police, don't think of this just as um, a pathway to a trial. Think about this as giving a voice to very often a very voiceless person. And it can be even a non-recent sexual abuse case where the person may have died um, the police might not be able to take that anywhere, but people do like the Truth Project, which has been set up particularly for that. Um, I think if we could switch our mindsets to realise that this is a very, very important process for people to go through in terms of, of recovery. But yes, um, we work with women with um, gender based violence um, very frequently. Great. Thank you so much, Catherine. Uh, and trauma informed care is going to be discussed in one of our breakout sessions this afternoon, if anyone is interested in more on that. Um, I might just ask a, a question of Ray. Um, so we understand and we know that the Law Reform Commission is undertaking work on adult safeguarding. And again, that's going to be discussed in one of our sessions this afternoon. But would you be able to give a very brief op update here on, on what's coming out of that work? Well, uh, thanks for that question. Um, so the Commission published a consultative paper on this earlier on this year, um, and we set out there some of the ideas and um, concepts. And I think the main issue that is going to have to be addressed in our final report, which we hope to publish next year, will be what kind of regulatory framework we need in order to capture all of the diverse areas where, um, as Seamus has already mentioned, it's very important to get the balance right between empowerment and protection. So uh, although we're talking about adult safeguarding here, we are very much uh, approaching it from a rights-based uh, analysis, uh, and that will be very important. Uh, in terms of the final recommendations that we made to ensure that there's an appropriate uh, rights-based approach with safeguarding as well. Uh, but the, the main recommendations are going to have to be around how the existing regulatory bodies coordinate with each other. And the final question then will be whether that coordination would be sufficient or whether we need a dedicated safeguarding authority uh, to deal with uh, the, the many different issues that arise. So those would be the kinds of thoughts um, very much influenced by the many, many submissions that we've received already 
uh, in preparing the report uh, that we hope to publish next year. Marvellous, thank you. Um, given uh, the time, I think I just have time for one more question uh, um, and it would be for Seamus and David asks, do you know, are there any particular categories of disability which are more frequently targets for disabled hate crime? And, and if so, which those would be? Um, there is some evidence in terms of the main offences that manifest in disability hate crime. And there's some uh, indications that people with learning disabilities feature more as victims in reported disability hate crimes. So... But in terms of offence categories, the largest category of offences is offences against the person. Uh, and the next largest would be public order offences, then targeted, uh, targeted theft, uh, robbery, burglary, sexual offences. Uh, they tend to be, but the largest grouping by far would be offences against the person. Right. Thank you very much, Seamus. Uh, unfortunately, that's um, all the time we have for questions, but thank you to everybody who um, submitted questions and apologies if we, we weren't able to get to them. And thank you again to our three speakers for their presentations and for taking those questions. Um, but it now gives me very great pleasure to introduce our final speaker for the morning plenary session, the Minister of State with responsibility for law reform, James Brown, TD. Minister, I know you have a very busy schedule and I want to thank you for your time and your contribution today. We at the NDA very much look forward to working with you in your important role. And we're aware of a number of significant initiatives ongoing in your department, which are relevant to persons with disabilities, including those with mental health issues. And we look forward to hearing more about those in your address. So I'll hand over to you now, Minister. Thank you very much, Aideen. I'm delighted to have the opportunity to be here today, uh, albeit virtually, but uh, to participate uh, in the National uh, Disability Authorities Conference. And I have, um, I suppose, just on a personal level, my own sister is, has spina bifida hydrocephalus, my goddaughter has Down syndrome. And so I have a very personal, I suppose, interest in the issues of disabilities and would have um, grown up around the, a lot of the challenges people with disabilities would have faced. And in opposition, I was also a mental health spokesperson. I would have worked very closely with um, Anne Rabbit at the time as well in, in her role of, um, in terms of children and also with uh, um, other people as well in terms of issues around uh, disabilities as well. Uh, and, um, so I would have, so I'm delighted to be here. Um, I understand that this morning's discussions, which covered a range of topics, including intermediaries, hate crimes, and jury service, were very enlightening. And I, it was unfortunate I couldn't have spent more time this morning participating, but uh, commitments unfortunately took me elsewhere. I very much look forward to receiving a report of today's proceedings and considering how best we can improve the rights of persons with disabilities within the criminal justice sector. Today's conference is another ex excellent example of how the National Disability Authority carries out its important role of providing information and evidence-informed advice to government and officials in the public sector on disability matters and promoting coordination of disability policy. This morning, you have heard from a range of international speakers who have highlighted evidence and good practice from other jurisdictions and issues that require attention within the Irish context. And this afternoon, we will consider disability issues within specific areas of criminal justice by engaging with a range of panelists, including speakers from government departments and government agencies. Developing policy informed by evidence and promoting greater collaboration among disability stakeholders is at the heart of today's conference. It is at the core of the National Disability Authority's work and is central to achieving access to criminal justice for persons with disabilities. Many of the issues which have been discussed this morning, as well as those which will be discussed during the six breakout sessions this afternoon, are matters which my department is keen to address over the lifetime of this government. There are a number of initiatives already underway to aid us in that endeavor. A large ratification of UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities has undoubtedly created an added impetus to our work. 
As many of you know, the Department of Justice and Criminal Justice Agencies are currently working in partnership to develop the first ever strategy for the criminal justice system. The purpose of the strategy is to set out our shared vision for a joined up criminal justice system to embed and sustain this collaborative work into the future, driving increased innovation and greater cohesion, leading to more effective solutions and sanctions and better outcomes for the public. The strategy for the criminal justice system will provide a framework to further embed a culture of working collaboratively within criminal justice agencies. It will drive innovation and increase efficiencies across the system, leading to better outcomes for those who engage with, it, with the system directly and for the public more widely. A cohesive, joined up criminal justice system is critical to meeting the needs of all persons in or at the edge of the system. Effective multi-agency coordination and collaboration is particularly important for supporting persons with disabilities, including those with mental health issues, who are engaging with the criminal justice system. Our system should be able to meet a diverse range of needs, including communication or healthcare needs. An effective criminal justice system has to work for everyone, including those with disabilities or mental health issues. The new strategy will be built around the needs of those interacting with the criminal justice system, with actions aimed at delivering a fair criminal justice system for all users, improving the accessibility of information provided to those who come into contact with the system, and ensuring victims, witnesses, and accused persons are, suppo are supported in providing their best evidence. I know that a lot of hard work is going on behind the scenes to finalize the strategy after extensive engagement with stakeholders throughout the year. The strategy and the associated implementation plan will be published later this year, with implementation beginning in 2021. I'm keenly aware that one of the issues that the National Disability Authority would like to see addressed as part of the new strategy is the important issue of intermediaries as a critical support in ensuring victims, witnesses, and the accused to provide their best evidence. My department recently received an advice paper from the National Disability Authority recommending the development of a pilot project, which would inform a national registered intermediary scheme. This matter was also raised in the recently published O'Malley Review and will be given due consideration in the, in the implementation plan currently be drafted for the recommendations coming out of the O'Malley Review. As some of you may be aware, in August, my colleague, the Minister for Justice, Helen McEntee, published the O'Malley Review regarding protections for vulnerable witnesses. The review is a thorough and expert examination of the entire criminal justice process around sexual offences, as it is encountered by victims and other vulnerable witnesses. At each point from the initial reporting of an offence through to the end of any court proceedings. The reforms identified have the potential to transform the manner in which sexual crime is dealt with in Ireland, not only the treatment of victims within the justice system, but indeed also broader societal attitudes and prevention of sexual violence. Implementing the recommendations outlined in the O'Malley report is a priority for this government. My department, together with the Department of Children and Youth Affairs, has also recently completed a public consultation on a draft youth justice strategy, which I know is the focus of one of the breakout sessions this afternoon. The strategy has been developed in light of the experience of state agencies and community partners who work with a comparatively small number of children and young people who come in contact with the criminal justice system. This work has built on the 2018 Youth Justice Strategy and the subsequent Youth Justice Action Plan 2014 to 2018. And it tries to deal with many of the gaps that remain, as well as new challenges which have emerged in recent years. It is intended that the new strategy will form an important element of the national policy framework for children and young adults, which is overseen by the Department of Children and Youth Affairs. I am well aware that the data from the Oberstown Detention Centre shows that children with disabilities and children with mental health issues are overrepresented in the youth justice system. I have no doubt that an effective youth justice system is one that meets the individual needs of young people with disabilities and mental health issues. Linked to this is the need for individuals working in the justice system to be disability aware and to have an understanding of how best to support and communicate with both adults and children with disabilities. In this regard, I want to acknowledge the National Disability Authority's work in developing guidance for those working in the civil and criminal justice system on how to communicate with and support people who have autism. It is my view that early intervention and diversion from the youth justice system are extremely important in this regard. And I am keen that these interventions are effectively considered as part of the finalized strategy. The new program for government also contains a number of ambitious commitments relevant to persons 
with disabilities and the criminal justice system. First, the Programme for Government Committee introducing hate crime legislation within 12 months of the formation of the government. This legislation will create specific offences to ensure that those who target victims because of their association with a particular identity characteristic, including those targeted because of their disability, are identified as perpetrators of hate crime. This legislation will be based on an aggravated offences model. As part of that work to update the legislation, a comprehensive public consultation has been carried out, which includes a public survey and an opportunity for stakeholders to make formal submissions. In addition, in order to ensure that legislation drafted is effective, the department carried out a comparative research on international best practice on hate crime legislation. This research is currently being finalized and is expected to be published in the coming weeks. The program for government commits to establishing a high level cross-departmental and cross-agency task force to consider the mental health and addiction challenges of those in prison and primary care support on release. Previous work in this area was carried out through an interdepartmental group established in 2012 to consider issues arising from the interaction of the criminal justice system and mental health services. The group's first report identified on how diversion at all stages of the criminal process could be facilitated. The second report in 2018 focused on matters relating to mental health services for prisoners, individuals subject to community sanctions and post-release supervision. It also considered matters relating to patients detained under the criminal law in Sanji Act of 2006. This task force will build on the work for the, the work of the interdepartmental group, tasked to examine issues relating to people with mental illness who come into contact with the criminal justice system. The task force will co comprise senior officials from both the Department of Justice and the Department of Health as well as relevant agencies and any other departments. The terms of reference for the task force are under development between the Department of Justice and the Department of Health. This task force will build on the work of the interdepartmental group tasked to examine issues related to people with mental illness who come into contact with the criminal justice system. Finally, might I also assure you all, all today that while the equality functions of the Department of Justice has recently transferred to the newly configured department, of children, disability, equality, integration, and youth, the needs and rights of people with disabilities will not be sidelined or forgotten by this department. Disability and the implementation of the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities very much remain, remain the responsibility of all government departments. We are also committed to implementing remaining actions assigned to the Department of Justice under a National Disability Inclusion Strategy. It is wonderful to have so many colleagues from the Department of Justice and agencies under the department's remit participate and join the conference today. For me, this level of interest, engagement and engagement is, all, is acknowledged, acknowledgement of the fact that the inclusion of persons with a disability is everyone's business, including those of the criminal justice sector. I want to thank you again for the invitation to address you today. I wish you the best of luck with your breakout sessions this afternoon, and I look forward to engaging with you further in the months and years ahead of these very important issues. And again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Minister Brown. There is certainly a lot of important work underway in your department and the National Disability Authority remains available to support this work in any way that might be helpful. Before we break for lunch now, I want to just acknowledge the team in the NDA for their very hard work in bringing today's conference to fruition. And I also want to thank all our keynote speakers from this morning, Catalina, Andrew, Catherine, Raymond, and Seamus for giving us what I'm sure you will agree was a very rich plenary session. And thank you again to the minister himself. So a big thank you to Susan Kenefick and Kieran Finley, who took the lead in selecting the theme and putting the program for today's conference together, as well as managing a sudden transition to the virtual world during the preparatory work earlier in the year. I'm sure from where we're all sitting today now, that looks like some impressive foresight. I'd also like to think, thank Jacinta Byrne, Heather O'Leary and Cormac McCarthy for providing so much behind the scenes assistance and support to bring the event to life. There are also many other NDA colleagues who've pitched in today and in recent weeks to help with the many jobs that we all know are so necessary to carrying off an event like this but I'm sure you'll agree that everyone concerned has done a phenomenal job. Thank you to you all and well done on what has been achieved in some very challenging and different circumstances this year. 
We're very honoured that the President of the High Court, Ms Justice Mary Irvine, will join us after lunch to speak about access to justice for persons with disabilities and highlight the important work of the court service and the judiciary in this area. I would also like to echo Helen's words and encourage you to take the opportunity to view the video library over lunch and all the presentations you've heard this morning will also be put online on the NDA conference page and there is a link to that and to other useful resources from your platform resource page. So Justice Irvine's address starts at 1.30, allowing for the breakout sessions to commence at 10 to 2. And so we hope to see you here at half one. But in the meantime, I hope you all enjoy your lunch. And I'm only sorry we can't provide the catering this year. Thank you to you all. <laughs>